malevolence is essentially a Freudian study of uh, you know nature versus nurture. Whether we're born serial killers or we're created based on our environment. And this is an exploration of the latter. I started filmmaking when I was 11 years old. Um, my father came home one day with a camera that had fallen off the back of a truck. And I remember thinking, you know, how fortunate that he happened to be standing there when it happened. You know, I'm dating myself here, but it was one of those camcorders where you had to actually carry around the VCR with you. So just to give you an idea of how long ago this was. That was what I did. I mean, some kids played sports after school. I, I made movies. As far as influences, you know, memories when I was a kid, something that really sticks in my mind is the first time I saw the, uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I saw that when I was 12 years old in the re-release through New Line. I saw it in a double feature with another film. I, I don't even remember the other film. And uh, I wasn't even going to stay to see it. And uh, that had a profound impact on me, and especially since it was one of the first films I saw where I actually wanted to find out not only who the director was, but the process behind making it, because I thought it was so effective. And I found out that it was done on such a low budget, it kind of put the bug in me that maybe, uh, you know, I could do this, you know, maybe it's possible. Horror is the one genre out there that you can get away with a low budget. And sometimes it actually enhances the film. Uh, a lot of my favorite horror films were all shot on micro budgets. Halloween was, Nightmare on Elm Street was very low budget, Texas Chainsaw. Sometimes when horror gets too big and it goes to Hollywood, it gets glossed over and it loses that visceral feel that you get from those low budget productions. With regards to influences of previous films on this film, my debut feature, uh, I would say the film that had the biggest influence would be Psycho. The actual structure of the script is very reminiscent of that, where it starts out being one type of story and then 30 minutes in gets turned on its head and becomes something completely different and much more diabolical. You know, I go to see horror films, scary movies, because it's like a roller coaster ride. You know, sometimes it's predictable and I know what's coming, but I still love to see it. You know, when you're making a slasher film, you're inherently working with derivative material because, you know, the, the genre has been done to death, no pun intended. So it's very difficult to come up with something that's uniquely original. So, you know, when I was examining this story and coming up with ideas, I look back at the movies that I liked growing up with. Uh, it's kind of like when you watch uh, Scream and they exploited all the um, cliches, you know, that kind of killed the horror genre. Well, I said, well, you know what, I want to go back and re-examine why I liked it in the first place and incorporate all of that into this film. If you're familiar with, with old horror films, you'll certainly see those subtle influences layered throughout Malevolence, and that was very intended, because I realized just by making a film like this, I'm, in, I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of directors who came before me who've done the same thing and, and done it really well. I'm amazed that people come up to me and find things that I really thought were deeply hidden, but you know, people really know their horror. Like for example, the door behind Riley when he's talking to Perkins, when it's being revealed what's been happening in this place for the last 20 years, I was actually painted to match Freddy Krueger's red and green sweater. I mean, that's really, uh, you know, obscure, but people get it. You want to tell me why I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning to drive nine hours to get to the middle of nowhere? We have to get out of here before he comes back. The first thing we did was uh, we tried shopping around the script, and um, even though we got you know good responses from people, it didn't really convince anyone to hand us over any money. So what we did was we went out and shot a preliminary trailer. We did everything in one day and uh, cut it together. And film's a visual medium, so obviously when you show somebody exactly what you're planning on doing, it kind of gives them a better idea of what to expect. So once we had shot the trailer, uh, we were actually able to raise a lot of money pretty much in a week after that. The entire process from beginning to end really was about six years. The script was written in the beginning of 1998 and uh, it was actually a combination of scripts that had been started back in 1995. And we didn't wrap until uh, around the end of 2002. So it was two years of shooting. Uh, it was supposed to be four weeks that ended up spreading out over two years. And essentially it took that long because we had issues with continuity, you know, the winter came so we had to stop and wait for spring, uh, constantly running out of money, going out and raising more money or getting more credit cards. It was always a conscious decision to shoot on 35. Um, a lot of independents are shooting on video and uh, it's to the point now where even shooting on 16 millimeter, uh, which used to be the stamp of student film, is now considered, you know, a step up. And so we wanted to shoot on 35 because we knew that it would 
give us a level of professionalism over and above what everybody else is doing. So that was always a conscious decision. Tiyoshi has an unbelievable eye. He's a, he actually won an Academy Award, a Student Academy Award for a, um, a student film that he did. And um, he really brought uh, an incredible level of professionalism to the film. In fact, uh, you know, I, I, I can say now that I, I feel really fortunate and lucky to have found him. He had done a lot of documentary work for A&E, and he brought that style, that, that immediate handheld kind of style, uh, uh, documentary style, to Malevolence, and um, I think it really worked well. And I think when you watch the film, you'll really see that he does just have an incredible talent for finding the right uh, lighting and finding angles and finding shadows in things uh, that really uh, are genuinely creepy. A lot of people ask, how can you shoot on 35 with such a minuscule budget? And basically what we did was we, you know, we took one or two takes per scene. It's a very dangerous way to make a film, and we were fortunate enough to have fantastic actors who were able to pull it off. Uh, we did a lot of rehearsal to make sure that they were prepared. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Free shoot hey. interviews. Behind the free show. <laughs> yeah. What's your name? Samantha. And who are you playing? Samantha. Playing. Samantha. Your real name is Samantha, Samantha. and you're playing Samantha? Samantha? Yeah. Well, that works pretty Samantha good. It does. It works really well. <laughs> and you? My name's Heather. What's yours? Jay. Hi, Jay. Hi. How's it going? Are you playing Heather also? No, I'm playing Ma Marilyn. Marilyn? Yeah. I can't find enough superlatives to describe the cast that we worked with um, from Samantha Dark, Heather McGee, Courtney Bertolone, uh, Richard Glover, Keith Chambers. One thing uh, with Keith Chambers is there's a scene where I gotta drag him into this field, man, and I had to drag him over and over and over and over again. So my only, my only hope is that there's another dragging scene in part two that it's Courtney and not Keith. <laughs> Courtney Bird alone really surprised me. Uh, she's mm -hmm. actually my niece, and um, when I originally wrote the script, uh, I kind of wrote it around her personality. So when you see her on screen, uh, that's her. That I mean, is that's the way she Courtney. is. She's a tomboy. You know, she's the kind of person who would pick up a bat and swing it at, at a killer who was attacking her mother. So uh, th I didn't really stretch that at all, and I think she did a phenomenal job. Richard Glover was a real daredevil. Talk about putting in 110%. Uh, I mean, for example, there's a scene where um, we have to break a chair over the killer's back. So Richard jumped in and said, hey, let me do it. And um, yeah. he actually let us break an actual chair over his back. I was yeah. holding him, any, and I any... didn't see this chair coming at him. Yeah. And I'm like, this is going to leave a mark, Rick. I mean, when you <laughs> see that on film, that, that really hurt. I mean, he, he didn't walk around for about a day after that. Two minutes of your life. We can pay off the note, take what's left, and head south. I spent the first half of this film a lot with Heather McGee. We were doing a lot of our scenes right in the beginning, and, uh, and Heather was fantastic. We, uh, she was sort of there, our, our chauffeur. She's one of the only actors on the set that had a car. So, uh, so we got to know each other very well, very quickly, and obviously playing boyfriend-girlfriend. Um, you know, we were just always together. Help! Help me! Help! Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> Samantha, um, she was a lot of fun. I had to get tip my hat off to her, someone who can say duct taped like that for days and weeks over and over again, and I'm picking her up and squeezing her and yelling her and chucking her, and you know, she was a trooper. <laughs> The original killer, the guy who plays uh, Graham Sutter, who's the owner of this place, was played by uh, David Guida, who actually lived in the location of the hideout house. Not only was he in the film, but the boy who plays Martin Bristol at age six was his actual son. And uh, it was just really convenient that he happened to look almost exactly like our um, killer, who was played by Jay Cohen. So that worked out really well. As a matter of fact, his wife also made it into the film. <laughs> you know, when, you're in, when, you, when it's low budget, you just use what you can get. Exactly. And yeah, uh, exactly. Not, not to take anything away from performance, which I thought was great. She played uh, Sally in the stands at the baseball stadium. She yours? Yes. What's her name? Courtney. 
We had casting sessions for about two months uh, in the heart of Manhattan. We'd actually cast everybody except for the lead actor uh, for Julian. I saw the audition for Malevolence in backstage. I submitted for it and then I got an appointment and then I couldn't make it for some reason. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> one of the only people who missed their audition was this guy named Brandon Johnson. <laughs> and um, Oops. we had completely just blown him off and uh, didn't think anything about it. And we were actually about to uh, sign a different actor when uh, Brandon remembered that he had an appointment and gave us a call. No. That's not what happened? No, that's not what happened. I had another job and I couldn't make it. Come on. That's what happened. Son of a bitch! Maybe it's all we got. I watched them empty a safe plus four drawers. It should be 10 times the amount. It's got to still be here. When I did show up for the audition, they had the trailer there, and I got a chance to see it. So I kind of had an idea of sort of what I was getting into, and yet I did not have an idea what I was getting into. But I was able to see that, like, OK, it's, it's, it seems pretty legit. You know, these guys are serious about what they're doing. Location scouting for this film actually took place over about nine months. Um, I logged about 10,000 hours of driving time just going from literally from state to state trying to find something that looked like this place. It's an interesting uh, way that we found it. We had actually found a different location in, uh, on Long Island and um, the person who owned the place had told us that we could go in, knock down the walls, uh, rip up the floors and the ceilings, basically do whatever we want, destroy the place if we want, because he was gonna tear it down, raise it to the ground, and rebuild the next year. So, uh, you know, we thought we had hit the jackpot. We went in, and my production designer, Andy Pan, and uh, his crew had spent about two weeks uh, just completely refacing everything inside and just tearing the whole place apart. And uh, about two days before we were scheduled to, uh, to shoot in that location, I showed up and um, the cops were there and the bank was there. Turns out that the bank owned the house and the guy who said he owned the house used to own the house but was foreclosed on a year ago. So this was his revenge on the bank. So, you know, we got handcuffed and hauled down to uh, the precinct. And when the police actually saw the paperwork that this guy erroneously signed, and the check that he cashed, they dropped all the charges, um, providing that we went back and repaired all the damage that we had done. So we lost you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in two weeks of mm. time, and we lost the location. So it was the middle of uh, principal photography, and we had no, nowhere to shoot. Uh, so we had to take a couple of months off and, and find a replacement. One of the reasons we chose Allentown as a location is it's got a very unique blend of architecture here. It's kind of like the town that time forgot. You know, you can shoot here and really, except for the cars driving by, you really just have no idea what year you're in. And it was a trip to come to Allentown because I remember being a young boy growing up in Minnesota and listening to the song Allentown by Billy Joel. <laughs> and going, oh, what do you know, I'm actually in Allentown. It does exist. This is sort of a street and town that time sort of forgotten and nothing, not, not too much has changed and it could kind of go both ways in terms of what time period is. Sometimes you'll see more modern cars or something, you know, it's, it's a mixture so it, it kind of worked out for us. So we're here at the uh, infamous bank robbery scene in Allentown and uh, it's freezing cold which is appropriate because it was about 10 below the day we shot it even though it was supposed to double for an autumn day that was about 70 degrees. Shooting here, I mean, we clearly didn't have like a huge locations person or you know people dealing with vehicles so you know we didn't have specific parking areas uh, designated and there's continuity issues to that because people pull up cars to be there when it's not supposed to be there and um, so that whole deal was a concern as well. You know we actually made the front page of the uh, newspaper here the main newspaper and um, had a picture of uh, Richard with the mask holding the gun and a lot of people actually mistakenly thought that the bank had actually been robbed. It's awesome. Because um, I don't think they make too many movies here in downtown Allentown. We had an exterior shot, you know, early in the morning, and uh, we realized that the bank, we didn't have clearance. So pretty much I had a half an hour to cover up what, what the bank was. You know, I didn't have a huge kit. I just had just some corrugated plastic which I was cutting and scoring on the sidewalk and um, double stick and everything, you know, covering ATM machines to large signs. Uh, one of the challenges of shooting here um, was that we only got permission from some of the stores 
to show on film. So it had to be, you know, really uh, cut frenetically because uh, we had to make sure that we excised out anybody who didn't want to be on camera. So when you see them running, that's why it kind of jumps around a lot because we get to a certain point where they, we say, oh wait, this guy doesn't want us on film. So we'd have to cut right here and then cut back. So that was, that was very difficult, that was challenging. But um, I think it actually added to the scene. It makes it a little more jumpy, a little more exciting. We shot in several places here. We shot in uh, Bethlehem, which is famous for the steel mills. Uh, so the drive to the bank, you can see the steel mills in the background. So we kind of lucked out that we were get, able to get that on film. Just getting here alone, the car, uh, I drove the car, actually. I think it was, who was with me? Maybe Richard Glover was with me in the car, but I called it the Beast, and the Beast made it from Long Island to Allentown. And then when we got here, the engine exploded. Luckily, we were able to get the car in the location where we had to shoot the scene, but then after that, we had to put it up on a, on a, some kind of a lift. And I remember Siyoshi, the DP at times, climbing outside of the car, being taped to it, and then shooting it from the outside as we were just cruising through different parts of Allentown. So that was a trip. That was crazy. That was, it's not going to make it. We had to actually uh, rent a U-Haul flatbed to bring it in here and kind of pretend it was working. Uh, that's why we cut away from the car when it's supposed to drive away. Uh, a little movie magic, a little behind the scenes movie magic, revealing the magician's trick. What happened, well actually here in Allentown, I guess it's a law that if you don't return the U-Haul the very next day when it's due back, uh, they send the cops. They don't just give you a phone call. So we actually, during lunch, uh, got a visit with the police and uh, they were ready to put the cuffs on me until we explained to them, oh wait, we just decided to keep it another day. Where are you headed? Home. Where's that? Richmeyer. I mean, we, we had some, some other run-ins with the law. I almost got arrested for impersonating an officer at a roadblock scene, <laughs> but uh, I was able to smooth talk my way out of that one. This location, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if it was only me that felt it, but it was really eerie. What I got jazzed about when we came to this location for the slaughterhouse, um, and I, I thought the more I started to see the authenticity of the locations that we were going to be using, that really helps me as an actor. You just play, you're able to play the environment. And uh, so that really added to the tone and where I was coming from. I don't um, think they really were aware of the fact that when I told them that the film took place in a slaughterhouse, it would actually be going to an actual slaughterhouse. Yeah. Malevolence was the first shoot it ever had, and, and Steve said it was an ideal location. <laughs> my name is Patricia Sturt. I live two farms over, and this was my grandfather's farm and slaughterhouse. When I got here, I was like a kid in a candy store. Like the little kid came out in me, and I was running around and finding stuff. And and the uh, I ended up bringing back a, a ledger book that I'd found digging around in here, which I gave to Steve, which we used in the film. That uh, that Kevin ended up using the FBI agent at the end. This place is a very authentic recreation of the actual place, and you know that. Um, that was really cool because we actually incorporated that, yeah. Into it had the, real into the stats story. from yeah. like the 1930s or 40s from mm -hmm. when they would slaughter uh, cattle here. They did that up until 1976. And my grandfather built this slaughterhouse, I believe it was around 1920, because my father remembers helping him when he was about eight years old. And it was in full production all that time. We were lucky enough to get full access to this place um, through the owner, who was uh, very generous to us. I met Steve. He was back at the Rising Sun property, which I sold to a Kevin Schmidt, a Carl Schmidt, Kevin's his brother, the banker, Carl Schmidt. And I sold it to him, and evidently they were back there, and they saw the car that was in the scene for the chase, car chase. And they asked him if he knew anybody that had an old property, and he said no. Subsequently, he remembered, and he knocked on the door and told him, yes, you can. He has an ideal place, and it turned out it was the ideal place when Steve saw it. He liked it. All the stuff that was originally here is still here, all the hooks, the wires, the... Uh, the dirty, bloody smocks and the boots and the gloves, is, uh, it's all still intact and uh, it's really foul. So you got to be really careful walking through this place. It was, it was all worth it because this place is, um, it's, it's, it's just a horror director's dream. 
A lot of the elements that we found here were kind of incorporated into the story. Originally, uh, the script called for an actual working slaughterhouse, and you know we had investigated some factories and burnt out buildings that we thought we could mock up to look like one. So uh, you can imagine how excited we were when we were able to find an actual uh, previously working slaughterhouse completely fully intact. Well, not that it's actually intact. I mean, the place is falling down around us, but um, you know, you've got the furnaces over there. You've got the um, you know the pulleys uh, for the hooks running above us. Um, you can actually still, if, if you pan up to the ceilings, you can actually see the, the, the fat from the animals that were killed is actually dried onto the ceilings. Um, and it's an unbelievable, like I said, there's a stench of death in this place. Um, we're down here in the basement of the slaughterhouse. And um, it's, uh, it's been a little over a year since we filmed here, but this is such an isolated location that a lot of the props that we brought in are actually still here. This is the barn where the animals were held. Uh, they were kept in here until we slaughtered them. And I remember as a child, they had some cows which gave birth to heifers, which was really my first calf I saw born was here. Uh, so then he would just store them here and keep them. Sometimes we'd buy something that would have to be fattened up, and then he'd fatten it up, and then when it's time to slaughter, he would <laughs> slaughter it. A lot of the times it'd be like, you know, we, we walk through these locations and I'd be like, oh my God, Steve, look, look what we have. And, you know, we, we would incorporate that into the storyline or, you know, use it. Yeah, there's actually a lot of, uh, a lot of the props that you see in the movie were actual tools and equipment that were used on the premises, you know, over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. I'm sure if we looked around, we could probably even find some of the bones from the, uh, the bull skeleton, if you remember from the movie. This is where that took place right up there. It's, uh, it's one of the more uh, graphic scenes in the film. This is the second level. Uh, the, the actual slaughterhouse has uh, multiple subdivisions inside uh, of basements and levels, and this is actually the second level up from the bottom basement, uh, where we actually never dared to go down. I, you'd have to put me in a spacesuit to actually go down there. So we're, we, we set up everything on this level where uh, Brandon comes up and this is where he of course finds Marilyn's dead body. It's actually a miracle. We were able to get a crane down here and set up to be able to do the crane shot that follows Julian as he uh, you know, rises up the ladder. And uh, logistically that was a nightmare, but you know, somehow we were able to get it done. Right above us is uh, the actual slaughterhouse uh, ovens. And uh, over there, you can't see it, but over there would be the, um, the refrigerators. They had a lot of um, meat cut up, stored in the refrigerators down here. And the refrigerators are, I would say, the size maybe 35 feet deep, uh, 20 feet high, and about 15 feet wide. And they have doors that were about well, maybe six to ten inches thick. I, I get a little nervous being down here because I'm told that the whole place could cave in at any minute. And it's, uh, you can't really see it, but um, there's a lot of uh, dead animal carcasses that are still in here from when they used to do the butchering. And every time, you know, once in a while we'll kick the hay around and we'll find something really nasty. And there's also a lot of animals living in here. You know, you can kind of hear them when you come down here. You'll hear the scurrying. <laughs> We didn't have the luxury of hiring people like security guards and stuff like that to watch the equipment overnight while we were sleeping. So what I would do is, you know, I would volunteer to watch the equipment so we didn't have to spend the two hours uh, pulling down and breaking down each night. What I would do is, there's no lights uh, for about 100 miles, so I would just walk around with a flashlight. And the first two nights, I heard things scurrying around my legs, I actually felt something, but I was really just too frightened to point it in that direction and see what it was. But one night, something actually tugged at my leg with its teeth and I shone the light down and sure enough it was what I thought was a dog but then when you see the scaly tail at the end I realized it was a rat the size of a dog so you know when you hear that saying you know they were rats the size of dogs uh, it's true they do exist the next morning I tried to find out where they were coming from and I, I shone the flashlight underneath this place and there was literally dozens of them feeding on whatever was left over from this place over the last 30 years and um, so it was it was pretty disgusting a couple of times, like, we would just be working in the house and all of a sudden, all three of us, we, we were in separate places, but we would just run out into the driveway because we were just freaked out. That's, that's our safe haven. It was like, get outside, get outside if, some, if you ever hear anything or you're scared. 
a lot of times I had to come up with creative ways to compensate for the fact that we had to compromise on certain things. You know, for example, there's a sequence where Julian and Samantha are walking from one house to the other, and um, you know, we had to kind of condense that. So you know, we actually got the whole shot in one take because we used the hill right on top of the house, and uh, it actually saved us about three or four hours. That was one of the, the amazing ironies of the whole film is that we would have what we intended, and then somehow something would fall mm -hmm. through, but then we'd end up getting something better. Yeah. And so <laughs> uh, that definitely made for some excitement. You never knew what the hell was going to come but next. But all, all independent films are like that. Yeah, Trust me. every single one. <laughs> this wasn't part of the plan. Neither was a bullet in Max's stomach. I think a big problem uh, as far as compromise goes is that you don't always get to work with the, the caliber of crew that you would hope to have. So, you know, you sometimes make a lot of sacrifices there. You know, there were certainly times where you know, because we were constantly going through a rotating door of, of crew members, we couldn't always rely on people like we should have. Um, for example, we actually had a sound guy who had never worked with a uh, DAT machine before. And so there is a certain section of malevolence that's completely dubbed. So see if you can pick that out. We had interesting crew. You know, we had probably a thousand crew members float in and out of this production. Um, a lot of weird characters, people trying to, like, steal film. One day we I found out that uh, the money that we were expecting to come in didn't come in, and my credit cards had all been maxed, so I had asked the crew if they could just hold their checks for a day. And uh, one of the crew members didn't like that idea, so he actually hijacked the negative and uh, ran off to New Jersey. And we had to ransom it back. We had to actually send one of our PAs with a handful of cash for um, the last two weeks for him and, um, and actually do an exchange where he handed us the film and we handed him the cash. Another example of something horrible that went wrong was uh, our, our UPM was also in charge of the RV and she had never uh, learned how to empty the RV toilets, which of course, since there was nowhere to go to the bathroom here, everybody was using the RV. So one day, uh, she had gone off to find a campsite to, uh, to empty it and it ended up uh, exploding all over her. So she came back covered in, you know what, at the same time we were shooting the scene with Richard Glover where he had just left the bank and he was holding up the cash. And we realized that we didn't have a cash stack, so we wanted to fill it like with singles and put hundreds on the ends, you know. But we didn't have it, so we asked around if anybody knew if there was a bank around here. We didn't know where we were, so we had no idea where to go. And so uh, this one guy said, I know my way around here. I, can, uh, I know where there's a bank. And so we gave him $200 bills and said, go get us 200 singles. Uh, two hours later, we were wondering, you know, where is this guy? Did he get lost? And that's when uh, our you know, UPM Natalie shows up, covered in shit and uh, walks up to me and she says, I'm covered in shit and I quit. And I turned to her and I said, well, before you quit, you know, where are you going to go? She says, well, I'm going to go back to the hotel and I'm going to shower and everything. And I said, well, um, she asked us what we were doing and I said, well, we hadn't gotten off a shot in two hours because the PA hadn't gotten back with the cash stack. And, I, and she said, well, uh, who did you send? And I said, we sent Greg. And she says, Greg who? We don't have a PA named Greg. So this is just some guy who was standing around watching the production and took us for 200 bucks. Another day of malevolence. Post-production, that's where the fun really began. At the time, I was living in a one-bedroom apartment with my wife. We had a small section of the house, you know, that was my studio. You know, so things like even doing ADR and looping, I actually had one of the actors standing in my closet. So we would, you know, remove the, uh, the reverberation in the room. But um, when you don't have the funds to hire a editor, a composer, you know, you just have to find a way. So what I did was I just took it all upon myself. It's one of the reasons why it was such a time-consuming process, but I had no other choice. So, you know, fortunately, technology has advanced to the point where someone like me, who doesn't have access to expensive Avid equipment and stuff like that, can now, for about five or six thousand dollars, actually set up their own studio in their house and, and do what I did. You know, you can actually edit your film, you can you know, uh, compose music, you can record right onto your computer. I paid very close attention to the sound with Malevolence. I'm a believer that music really makes the movie. You know, film is a marriage of, you know, picture and sound. And I think a lot of directors really overlook the power of the soundtrack and in, in their films. And I, I really feel like it can be a huge enhancement to the overall presentation and uh, I think with malevolence it really adds uh, a whole nother dimension to the film it's almost like a another character in the movie I have a background in musical theory I don't really consider myself a musician I play piano um, but I don't really consider myself a, a composer 
And again, I composed the score because I couldn't hire a composer to do it. The fact that, that he was able to write it and create it in a room all alone by himself is a, you know, you really, you put a lot of hard work into it and it really pays off and it, it's, it's amazing when you hear it in the, th in the theater. The music was composed over a couple of months um, using a Kurzweil and a Korg, a Triton and a couple of other samplers and um, you know it's amazing sampling technology today is just a, it, it really allows you to sound a lot bigger than you are you know you can actually sound like you're working with a symphonic orchestra um, so it's, it's really incredible what you can do now with basic tools you know the thing about independent filmmaking to me is it's all about persistence uh, you know if you set a goal for yourself there's a lot of obstacles along the way and um, you know there's so many things that can derail you from, from completing this goal. But if you stick with it and, uh, and you're determined, it, anything is possible. I mean, we encountered so many problems and obstacles and, and issues with this film that uh, you know, I really at some point believed it would never get finished. Um, but I always knew this is what I wanted to do. So I always knew that at some point I would complete it. And, um, and I'm really glad I did, you know, because the rewards are, are incredible you know it's uh, there's, there's no feeling like actually sitting there with an audience and watching your work and um, you know it's it's worth it it's it's worth the struggle <laughs>